Hello, and welcome to a lecture on social determinants of health and health equity. My name is Dr. Neetu Abad, and I am from the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm a behavioral scientist and lead for the Demand for Immunization team. Next slide. So today we're gonna to talk about some really important concepts. Uh, we're gonna talk about social determinants of health as well as concepts around health equity, vaccine equity, and guidance and resources for addressing vaccine equity that you can um, explore on your own time as well. Next slide, please. The objectives of today's lecture is that we want you to learn to describe basic principles of social determinants of health, health equity, and vaccine equity. We want you to be able to identify factors contributing to vaccine inequity in underserved populations, address vaccine inequity in communities of focus that you're working with, as well as integrate an equity lens in demand, vaccine demand and uptake work, and as well as any other work you may be engaged with in public health. Next slide. When we say health equity, what is it that we mean? Health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. It requires focused and ongoing societal efforts to address inequalities and health disparities that are avoidable. Next slide. So social determinants of health really is a, are a broad cluster of factors, and they are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age, and these affect health outcomes. So they can be childhood experiences, the, the environment that we're born into, the way that we're raised, um, housing, access to housing, access to education, the kind of social support that we may experience, either from our immediate family or extended networks, you can derive social support from social support from a variety of places. Um, the income that we are uh, of the maybe the family that we're born into, uh, employment prospects, as well as access to health services. These are the structural factors that really help shape our lives. Next slide. Social determinants of health reflect social factors and the physical conditions in the environment in which we live. Um, these factors are known as social and physical determinants of health, and they really impact a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes. And there, are, there has been a lot of research uh, demonstrating the link between these structural factors and health. Next slide. So now we can shift from sort of the broader framework of social determinants of health and think more deeply about vaccine equity, as we're all involved in talking about vaccine demand and uptake during this training. So vaccine equity really means ensuring that everyone everywhere has equal access to vaccines. Um, it's the belief that vaccines should be allocated across countries and regions based on needs, regardless of economic status. So this is sort of the ideal uh, vision of the world in which everyone has equitable access to vaccines. Next slide. But what happens when we have vaccine inequity or differing levels of access to vaccine by virtue of geography or other characteristics? Underserved populations with immunity gaps who have disproportionately high risk for vaccine preventable diseases. This can include zero dose children in communities, populations affected by conflict, disaster and humanitarian crisis, um, immigrant, refugee, and migrant populations, populations with gender related barriers to immunization, and populations without access to recommended vaccines. So all of this is kind of a result of what happens when we don't have equity and vaccine uh, distribution and uptake. Next slide, please. So this is a graph depicting um, vaccine rollout by upper middle income, high income, lower middle income, and low income countries. And you can see there are stark differences with how COVID-19 vaccines have been rolled out with these three different strata in mind, three, four different strata in mind, where low income countries have had a much slower rollout between February of 2021 and February of 2022, as compared to lower middle income and upper middle 
middle income or high income countries. Um, this is also evidenced in differences in population coverage. So you can see in high income countries, three out of four people or around 72% of people have been vaccinated with at least one dose um, as of June 8th. But in low income countries, we have much slower uptake. One in six people or, or just a little less than 18% have been vaccinated, um, even though uh, we've had uh, vaccines available. So these are, this, is, this kind of difference is very stark. Next slide, please. We also know that it is more expensive for low-income countries to reach their citizens with COVID-19 vaccines. So high-income countries have to increase their healthcare spending by only 0.8% to cover the cost of vaccinating 70% of the population, whereas low-income countries have to expend more energy or more resources, around 56.6%, to cover vaccinating 70% of the population because it takes more to get Get those resources in the first place and then also ensure that you're reaching the last mile those health facilities with the with the vaccines so you we have to remember that it is not just supply it is also the cost of uh, getting resources out to the communities that is incorporated in the overall cost or the expenditure by the health system in vaccinating their populations and there are differences between countries and what they are able to do next slide please and we can see here uh, that supply certainly has followed that same trajectory, vaccine supply, um, where high income countries have had a much faster and more secure vaccine supply than low income countries. And this has contributed to vaccine inequities that we have seen on a global level and it continue to play out. Next slide, please. So let's think about all of the vaccine equity pain points or touch points along the journey to vaccination. So first we start with um, having knowledge, awareness, and beliefs in vaccination. Uh, you can think about that availability of vaccine information may vary by language and literacy levels. Um, vaccine recommendations may differ by trusted sources, and this can contribute to uh, vaccine equity or inequity. At the intent phase, uh, you can have varying levels of trust in vac vaccination institutions, as well as varying levels of social norms around vaccination. At the stage where you're preparing or you're thinking about your cost and the effort you may be able to expend, there may be inequities in vaccine scheduling, appointment scheduling, appointment related costs, transportation or logistics and costs related to that, as well as any time that you spend actually getting vaccinated. And then you think about what happens at the point of service. Uh, there may be variations in how convenient the site is, how accessible it is, how safe it is, if it's located in a part of the community you feel safe going to, and whether there's adequate supply at the, the point of service. Then you think about the care. Are you being educated around the vaccine? Do you get the side effects explained to you as well as what to do if you experience them? And do you get your questions answered? And then finally, after service, how easy is it to come back to the, the point of service to get a second dose. Um, if you experience side effects, is there adequate AEFI or adverse event monitoring and response? So all of these uh, factors are related to the concept of vaccine equity and can make a difference in the experience of getting vaccinated. Next slide, please. One of the most persistent immunization barriers that we see that also contributes to uh, to vaccine inequity are differences um, when it comes to gender. So here is a perspective uh, from a community member in Sierra Leone or, or somebody speaking about a community um, when it comes to the role that gender plays uh, in seeking and accessing immunization. People in this community who fetch water have to queue for a long period before fetching water. There are women who will go to the well very early in the morning and will spend most of their time just to access drinking water. Most will come home late and not take their child to the facility for immunization. When they are back from fetching water, they will have to engage in domestic chores and sometimes the men will be around idling. 
Women have a lot of domestic work to do and at the same time take care of the babies. So you can see in this quote and in this image that the women who are have the responsibility often in the household of getting the children immunized are also engaging in many pr pr competing priorities, including the basics of getting water and other necessities for their household. Uh, that is a gender disparity that also contributes to whether that same mother will have the opportunity to take her child for vaccination. And if she does not, then that child will not get immunized. So that is one of the ways in which some of these social factors contribute to each other to lead to differences in vaccination outcomes. Next slide, please. Housing and citizenship status are also potential barriers to immunization. So here is a perspective uh, from someone in a refugee camp in Thailand. I have to take care of the children at home and to make sure they're fed and go to school. That is my priority and motivation. COVID-19 impacted our community a lot. We cannot travel, cannot share food, or even see other families. When thinking about vaccine, I want to, but if something happens to me, who will take care of them? So here again, you can see a lot of the competing priorities that communities have when they are deciding whether to get vaccinated in this case with COVID-19 vaccines or other routine immunizations. So these are very real ways that these social factors can, uh, can kind of affect each other when it comes to immunization and lead to vaccine inequity. Next slide, please. So we've talked about what some of the factors that lead to inequity or equity are, but what are some of the ways that we can level the playing field and give people the opportunity to achieve optimal health? One is making sure people have access to education and employment opportunities where they are, that they have access to accessible transportation, safe and affordable housing, um, affordable and uh, healthy foods in their community, that they have availability of recreational facilities, that they have access to necessary and essential health services. They have strong social networks and community bonds, cultural norms and values that support healthy lifestyle and healthy behaviors. And you can see the work that we have ahead of us to ensure that everyone across the world has access to these very basic things that can lead to a healthy lifestyle and optimal behaviors. Next slide, please. So how are some other ways that we can work together to address vaccine inequity? Well, one of the things we really need to understand are the factors that contribute to inequities. And we can do this by using indicators, both qualitative and quantitative, to assess the, the social determinants of health in any given community or, or area. So we need to invest in diagnostics. We need to conduct social and community engagement activities, focusing on underserved populations. We need to engage with trusted community-based and civil society organizations, of which there are many represented in this training in particular. Next slide, please. We want to improve the quality, accessibility, and availability of health services. So it's not just enough to make sure that, say, a, a vaccine is available at a health clinic. We need to ensure that there's adequate quality of health service delivery also in that facility integrate services and collaborate across sectors. And that is something we need to do much more of in public health to ensure that we are not working in just a siloed way that we're working with other health sectors as well. Um, ensure timely programming for underserved populations, especially in emergency settings. Uh, there's a lot that happens when an emergency occurs in a community. And we need to understand that and the way that emergencies affect underserved populations. And at a broader level, develop policies and plans that support individual and community health efforts. Next slide, please. The Immunization Agenda 2030 Strategic Priorities, which really focuses a lot of agency efforts in this area, really has a carved out space for improving vaccine equity. So we're taking, we're seeing this uh, topic take center stage when it comes to immunization programming for the future. Next slide. So what are some truths that we can kind of 
converge on when we're thinking about addressing vaccine inequity in the field. One is that there are many social, geographic, political, economic, and environmental factors that create challenges to vaccination access and acceptance, and we've covered some of them today. That vaccine inequity jeopardizes the safety of everyone and contributes to growing inequalities between and within countries, and we have seen this play out on such a dramatic scale when it comes to COVID-19. Addressing vaccine inequity includes efforts in equitable production, distribution, and administration of vaccines. So really holistically understanding the process by which we create and distribute vaccines and how important it is to have the concept of equity in mind. Next slide, please. What are some uh, best practices when we're looking to address vaccine inequity in the field? We need to have an equity focus in everything we do, from diagnostics to intervention implementation, and importantly, monitoring and evaluation. And it's this last piece that can tell us whether some of our efforts have contributed to or helped uh, issues of, of equity in the field. Listen to and communicate with communities that are disproportionately affected by vaccine preventable diseases and truly try to incorporate their perspectives in our programming. Identify and reduce barriers to vaccine acceptance and access. And that's really that last point that we're, we're all working on together from our various disciplines. Next slide. We need to think carefully about our metrics and evaluations, and in some cases use existing tools to identify populations affected by vaccine inequity. This can include demographic and health surveys, social vulnerability, index, census variables, and different kinds of surveys. For ex example, one that is based on women's empowerment is, and is a global index. We need to really double down on our efforts to use community-based participatory research methods to address vaccination challenges that affect underserved populations by involving them in the process in a very real way. And that's really vital, I think, to all of the work that we do. Next slide. So we know that we're going to have differences in the kinds of resources that we can bring to bear when we are addressing vaccine inequity in the different environments that we work in. So if you're dealing with a low resource environment, you can Im analyze immunization data by socioeconomic status, gender, geography, race, ethnicity, caste, or any of the other kind of factors that are really important. You can stratify your data and prioritize interventions that way. If you want to step it up, you can engage with community-based and civil society organizations that work with vulnerable underserved populations, understand their perspectives, and really follow their work uh, as they are based in the community. And then, of course, even more so, we can engage stakeholders, including communities of focus and target, to co-design immunization interventions, increase the kind of communication we have between community members and decision makers and policy makers, and develop mechanisms to follow up, monitor, evaluate, and feed back the progress that we're making in reducing vaccine inequity. And all of these things together are uh, doable in various ways, and we should strive to include them in our work. Next slide. These are some key references and resources. There, have, there has been some uh, tremendous work in this area uh, on behalf of multiple different types of agencies and, and people thinking hard in this space. And I encourage you to um, access these resources and look at the long history of social determinants of health wor work and this application um, in vaccine work. I would say in, you know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, this topic has really taken off and have become very important. So I, would, um, I hope that you're able to find some time to read through the resources that have that are available for you. Next slide. Thank you so much for uh, listening to this lecture on social determinants of health and we're happy to uh, take any questions. Thanks.